Um, and then I started thinking, well, but of course this is New York City, and you know, I at least to me, and if you're if you're somebody who really observes, you know, the city. Anytime you walk down the street, you can see or smell really traces of either Robert Moses or Jane Jacobs, depending on what street you're on and what's going on around you. Um, and, and because it's New York City, it's it's complicated. It's not you know it seems in a way like the lines are very crisp and very clear and very sharply drawn, but but maybe they're not. So I thought, well, it's a great idea for an opera, but I don't I don't envy these guys the job of writing it. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I'm really fascinated and excited to be sort of an observer um, of this process. And I guess I, the first question, really, the obvious question is, um, how did this happen? Where did the idea to do this come from? Um, and, and how, I mean, where do you even start with something like this? Uh, hi, thanks for coming. <laughs> um, in the middle of working on Plan of the City, I think Judd and I got the sense that it, it was turning into something we were really happy with and wanted to continue working together. And so some, in the, you know, the end of some meeting in that process, Judd raised the idea. And, you know, I think I just said yes. And then a significant amount of time went by and we finished that film and it had its life. And then we, you know, reignited that conversation. Um, so that, that's, that's the beginning from my end. Yeah, well, something to say is that Josh and I both have um, personal histories with uh, this neighborhood. I grew up in Ranch Village. Josh went to school down here. Um, Washington Square Park is where I played as a kid. So the idea of somebody ramming Fifth Avenue right down the middle of it, you know, it's it's becoming a little bit uh, less distasteful of every new building that NYU erects. But <laughs> at, at the same time, you know, that's sort of like a very deep hurt. When you start to dig into the story, you realize that a lot of people have much deeper hurts than that um, because of what Moses did. But then you also start to realize that the city that you, you know, live in, grew up in, wouldn't be the city that you grew up in uh, if it weren't for this person. And there's a sort of nostalgia that pushes in both directions. You know, I'm nostalgic for the Van Wyck, right? Which is strange. It's true. It's very strange. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's just to say that, you know, we're working on this film, we're working on the Planet City, we're working on, uh, we kind of co-wrote the piece together. I like to think of it as a double helix, where we were each writing our own thing, but they sort of wrapped around each other in the creative process. Um, it made sense to choose something where, in a sense, the stakes were a little bit higher. Um, and this is a project that had been sort of percolating in my head for a while. Uh, and when we saw what this first project that we did together felt like uh, to both of us, it was clear to me that that was, was the time to act. But the process now going forward, I mean, one of the nice things is because no opera company came in and said, do you want to do this? You know, it would be nice if they did in a way, but it also the fact that we came up with it ourselves has meant that it's been very much a project of our own, uh, our own pace, our own uh, collaborative kind of impetus from the beginning. It continues to be that today. Well, I guess, is there, in your mind, a way that Robert Moses sounds and a way that Jaden Jacobs sounds? I guess that is a question for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is something that we're talking about a lot in, in the planning stages. You know, we, uh, we've been planning this now for a few years, but it's become more real last year. We have um, a fantastic librettist, the poet Tracy K. Smith, uh, who can't be here tonight, but she brings a kind of different angle uh, to these questions than you might expect because she is a poet and not a playwright. Um, and we have a choreographer, uh, Laura Rawls, who's going to be doing a lot of the motion, the movement of bodies on stage. I bring them up because we're, we're tackling these questions and trying to think about, okay, what is a Robert Moses approach in a way, what, what is Robert Moses in a way that can translate to all of these media? And what is Jane Jacobs in a way that can translate to all of these media? So that when you're telling the story, you're not just telling the story of, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then, you know, yay, there was no Lower Manhattan Expressway. Yeah. <laughs> we were also telling the story of the theories that were coming into conflict. You know, with Jean Jacobs, she's really about this kind of horizontal approach, this street level approach to the city. And Robert Moses, as you know, we keep showing you his, his model, that's how he looks, right? From bird's eye view, verticality. 
those have, I think, for me as a composer, implications in the way that the, the sound, I wouldn't say, you know, it's not going to appear in the wall, it's not going to be like the elbow appears, and that's <laughs> it's Robert Moses' music. You know, WWF style. Um, but there is something in the way that I think compositionally, um, you can reflect theory through um, structure, through uh, just different aspects of compositional practice. So that would definitely be part of my, my role in this process. And I'm curious. Also, well, Josh, you you know you touched upon this visual thing, which is that Robert Moses is looking down from above, and and Jane Jacobs is at street level. Does that inform how you're thinking visually about this at all? Or? Yes, definitely. Um, and to I guess bring that together with what with what Judd was saying is one of the one of the aspects of our process that I'm really enjoying is that Judd and Tracy and I and Will as well are having story discussions together, and we have these different channels. There's music, and there's text, and there's visuals, and there's movement on stage. And because we're developing everything together, um, we can decide that this idea can be carried by visuals, and Tracy doesn't need to worry about text. And we can decide where each of us can, um, can shoulder loads, which loads should be on multiple, everyone at once, and which should be divided up. So, um, I mean, one, one sort of very clear example in my mind about that is the, the, the mechanics of how Robert Moses' empire functions and how money comes in is extraordinary and extraordinary complex, extraordinarily complex. And I would hate to have to ask uh, a, a, a poet we're working with to spend the amount of time it would require to explain all that. And so what we're going to be able to do is in his office have a window out of which have an aerial view of the cars passing through the tolls in, uh, on the Triborough Bridge, because his office is, was on Randall's Island above the Triborough Bridge. And the audience, I think, will pretty quickly understand his perspective and where he is in space and understand how, in part, he's coming to do all of these things. And um, the music and the text can be more about why um, and the emotions driving. Um, so that's a little bit of those two things. Well, I mean, Judd was just saying, talking about uh, narrative and how, how literal or unliteral you want the narrative to be. Is there a particular aspect of the, the Jane Jacobs, Robert Moses saga, some, some piece of the story you want to tackle, or is it more uh, kind of a grand sweep of um, sort of the, the sort of one idea about what the city is versus another idea about what the city is or what the city could become. Am I leaving anything out? <laughs> no, that's right. I mean, you know, Robert Moses, 
many of you probably know the story, but he, he wasn't a person who really lost very often. Um, it wasn't really until, Jane Jacobs wasn't the first person to, to beat him, uh, but she was one of the first, and it wasn't her alone, of course. Um, but the, there's a sort of interesting moment in the middle part of the century, you know, uh, this story is, it's a very much a 20th century story. It's a story about these different periods of time, these different approaches, you know, Robert Moses, somebody who didn't drive himself, whose ideas of what the perfect city was were informed by his uh, youthful experience, uh, you know, being driven around in these luxury automobiles and having practically no traffic on the streets. So for him, at that point, from that point on, the automobile was the way of the future. It was the way that he would move around the beautiful city, completely detached from the realities that he was actually building in. That's a story that feels actually quite resonant, you know, when I think about what the city is becoming and what cities are in general, how cities function for different people, oftentimes the people making decisions being quite removed from the experiences of those whose policies, uh, their policies impact. And Jane Jacobs, you know, comes up at this time, when, I mean, she's self-taught, you know, she innovates and, and creates this completely new theory that um, revolutionizes the, the landscape of her field, but she's also, you can also think of her as uh, an important person in 1960s activism. You know, like this is the civil rights movement. This is not, that's not her struggle necessarily, but it's wrapped up in the idea of people power, of pushback against authority, and think of that as being part of what the city actually is, of the sort of not revolutionary fervor, but the idea of uh, a movement of people taking control over their own destiny, over what's been handed down to them, as impacting the actual structure and layout of the physical city in which they live. I mean, that is just a fascinating story. It's a fascinating idea. And so these two coming together isn't just Robert Moses. It's not just Jane Jacobs. It's also two very different approaches to how leadership and power struggle uh, function in the city and in the world that are unique, I think, to that moment in time. So it's really trying to get at the idea of the, the experiential city, the city as a place that's defined in a way by the people who live there versus the city as this theoretical construct, which is, you know, mid, mid century, mid 20th century, what a lot of people thought that they could just, you know, do that the urban renewal movement was about sort of erasing the mess and, and replacing it with something clean. Um, there was a, a Jane Jacobs, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to quote it uh, exactly, but I mean, when she looks at Le Corbusier's drawings for you know, his, his radiant city, what she sees is something very clear and simple, and she says, just like an advertisement. Um, whereas, you know, a real city is something much messier and more complex. Um, and it's a funny moment, because I think in a lot of ways, I mean, you talk to, uh, you know, just any developer, and he'll start spouting Jane Jacobs at you, and it's, very, it's a very weird thing. I mean, Jane Jacobs is sort of how we think about cities right now, but at the same time, I think the um, the sort of the advertisement, the rendering, the, the slick rendering. If, if you're online, people are just always, you know, blogging and tweeting um, these renderings, and we're kind of getting seduced by that also. So it's it's not. I guess the issue of who won is 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 still a little bit up in the air. Thinking about the um, the rendering and advertising. And and some of those things, you know, I, as I've been thinking visually about what images I'm interested in for the opera, and thinking about the long list of things that Moses built, uh, bridges are very interesting to me because I think the bridge is one place where Moses's idea of the world is actually not so far off from the world. You have sky, and you have sea, and you have a bridge, and that's it. And it's really quite modernist and perfect. And, 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 you know, the Verrazano Bridge is gorgeous. And the place where it gets messed up is the on-ramps to get on the bridge. <laughs> and that's, you know, a, and that's a problem, um, even for the, Veraz the beautiful Verrazano Bridge. Um, so I, that's, uh, that just spring that comes into my head. Um, and another thing that we've been thinking about lately is um, uh, we've been discussing um, you know, ways, ways to share this material and our work with students as we develop this project and in thinking about um, the places that they occupy, um, I realized recently that the places where the Jane Jacobs story happens are very familiar spaces to us. And I think that's part of 
why her story is so exciting. You know, meetings take place in her living room or her kitchen, and protests take place on the street or in the park. And the climactic moments of you know when she gets arrested uh, and a turning point of the Lower Manhattan Expressway happens in the Seward Park High School auditorium. You know, I know what public school uh, auditoriums look like. You know, mm -hmm. I've, I've been to all of those places. And in contrast, the places where Robert Moses makes decisions are in Albany, you know, and in, and in Gracie Mansion, and in his island fortress on Randall's Island. Like, you know, you can't make that up. Um, I, there's just things coming to mind from. Although, although I mean, the results of Robert Moses' decisions are all around us all the time. Um, I was telling you this, I guess, the first time we talked, which is that my, one of my theories of New York is that any time you're in a place that feels wrong somehow, that somehow doesn't feel like New York, it turns out that Robert Moses had a hand in making <laughs> that place. You know, the, the way that First Avenue is incredibly wide by the UN is, is all, you know, Robert Moses uh, sort of clearing away messy commerce so that the UN could have a nice sort of expanse of, of plaza, you know, Cabin Plaza in, in, in downtown Brooklyn is all like a little, it's a little strange, and it's because there was a Robert Moses slum clearance that happened there. There's just all these places that are a little off, and Moses is always there. Both, both of those spaces are um, designed for the scale of cars, as opposed to people. And one of the big differences, I think, in how they think about cities is Robert Moses views them a lot is how do I move through, how do I get through it from one part of it to another or out of it um, to a, a beach, a beautiful beach that I, that I made. And Jane Jacobs thinks about how can I, what happens when I stay in it and walk around the street and, and to her scale is um, by definition human and he's interested in that automobile scale and that's some of probably the discontinuity. I think it's important to say also that it's not, I mean that right now it's very easy to build to make Robert Moses the villain, and you know he was a despicable person in many ways. So that's that, and that's there, and it's gonna be part of the story. But there's also this beauty to some of the things that you know we're describing. I mean, to this day, you know, the idea of like, the automotive age, the, the possibility that it holds, the visions of you know a beautiful city laid out in just the right way. I have to admit that it has an appeal, and I want that to be part of the offer. I want that. Robert Moses' music is a beautiful, it's a clean music, in addition to also having the threat of power behind it, the threat of what we know it also does on its way to trying to enact that vision. I wonder if this brings up the idea of what an opera is in this day and age, um, and sort of, you know, does there have to be a hero and a villain? Does there have to be clear good and evil? Um, how, does, how does an opera work now? I guess I'll feel that first, um, though Josh has, I'm sure, things to say as well. I, opera is you know, a very old art form. Uh, in some way, the concept of classical music, as we think of it, you know, which itself is like old, starts with opera, right? Like Monteverdi creates this form, and suddenly there's this approach to theatrical music that has changed so much over the last um, you know, 400 years that to try to pin it down and say, well, opera is what happens at Lincoln Center, or opera is what happens when, you know, X, Y, or Z, um, thing that I associate with opera, probably from like Bugs Bunny cartoons, <laughs> takes place on stage. Like, that's, there is opera like that, but there's also opera in many other ways. And we have a responsibility, I think, as artists working today to allow those forms to live and breathe with us as artists and to change. We can also not use them. I mean, we can say that we're working on a new theater piece or a new work of art about Robert Moses J. Jacobs, and you, you probably would still come, but maybe some of you wouldn't, because the idea of having an opera about that puts it in this grand tradition. Like, like you were saying before, you know, we have that association that there's a weight to opera. And certainly that's part of why I think it's correct for us to use this term. Uh, the other frank reason is just that opera tends to be uh, a work where there's music throughout. And so, you know, Josh was talking about different people um, having different burdens, responsibilities to tell the story throughout the, the course of our, our, our story, throughout the course of our narrative, I can never really take a break in this process. Uh, there's always going to be music, even if I'm not chiefly telling the story at a given time, 
my story, my storytelling hat has to remain on in the background. So it's opera in sort of a technical sense in that way, but I think opera still should be a term that we apply to these grand narratives mm -hmm. and allow to move uh, with the culture of our time. I think you nailed it. <laughs> Okay. Well, you know, Josh, you have a really unique visual style, and you're, you know, the one person who actually discovered that New York City has a space program, um, and a real use of those things that we think of as water towers. Um, but I'm wondering um, how, how that visual style translates to the stage. How does that, how does that happen? Uh, well, one thing in th th talking about the visual style and plan of the city is that it uses collage, and that's natural for the story that I wanted to tell because collage is the language of architectural proposals. So you can sort of look at Plan of the City as a long, animated, uh, fantastical architectural proposal. Um, I always loved, uh, like, Klaus Oldenburg's watercolor of uh, a popsicle upside down in Park Avenue. The popsicles, I don't know, 20 stories high or something like that with a bite taken out of it and cars drive through. Um, so, proposals for skyscrapers that blast off. And the, the, that language is right for the opera as well. So um, the collage and architectural proposals and impossible architectural proposals will continue um, in the opera. But, or and, uh, it's, it will become three-dimensional. Um, you know, you know Planet City and Manhattan is on a single screen. And what we're looking, investigating now is ways to embed animation in a set that has multiple facets and multiple dimensions um, so that the cast is within it. And um, what we're working on is uh, finding ways for them to actually affect the set, pick it up and move it around so that they can create and uh, disassemble their environments because control of your landscape is really one of the core issues at play in this opera. So, um, that's you know part of the investigation, and um, movement will play a big role. You know, as you, if once you have cast moving things around, well, that's one type of movement. And so I think that um, Judd and Tracy, with the words in those four of us, but there there will be uh, Judd and Tracy are going to have a very special um, collaboration in how those words get set to music, and Will, the choreographer, and I are also going to have a, a you know a particular relationship in how the images and the movement um, work together to create something happening. So you're going to try and make the idea of planning physical, sort of physical and visible and sort of visceral. Planning and also um, uh, execution. Huh. Yeah, and, and you asked how Robert Moses sounds. We're working with Will on uh, how, you know, how, how Robert Moses, well, we were working on how Robert Moses moves, but also how the, the ensemble will move in a system that echoes the ideas of Moses, you know, a sort of, uh, it might be more ordered or something like this. And Jane Jacobs in The Death and Life of Great American Cities, there's literally a, a recipe, a set of instructions for what she calls the ballet of the streets, and it comes, to, you know, and it even includes they don't take a bow at the end. Um, and so there will be a Jane Jacobs inspired way of, of movement as well, which if his is order, hers isn't, is not, Chaos. Uh, you know, some of her ideas are about how things we think are chaos actually have complex patterns, and we just haven't figured out what those patterns are. And so maybe yeah, for, there, there are. For, for a second, I was just envisioning the, the uh, Jacobs Moses ballet. <laughs> you know, a lot, a lot has been. I mean, Jane Jacobs wrote a tremendous amount, and a lot has been written about both Moses and Jacobs. And I'm just wondering, um, are there things?